Squash the beef and brush your teeth. What's going on, guys? It's ninth corner of the octagon with Garrett and Lincoln. And man, have we got a banger for you guys today. What a barn burner. Exactly. It's a, a county crusher. Uh, a land liquor. Uh, a, 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 a country cuntifier. Um, whatever you whatever you can possibly think of, UFC 249 was it, and it delivered. It delivered with only having one mishap, which you can possibly just chalk up to just bad bad timing for uh, Jacques and Souza and his mm. family. Hope everything's going well with them. Yes. But other than that, one little. That one little flip up, everything went exactly as planned, pretty and much. it was amazing. Pretty much. So we're going to do something pretty crazy here. Uh, obviously, I've already uh, mentioned this in a video prior, but uh, this week, uh, two podcasts are going up on the channel, and this one, of course, is going to be about UFC 249, as we've already mentioned, but we're going to do something a little bit different to the, what we usually do, and how we format this, and we thought, man, fuck it, let's just start off with the best and, and mainest event of all time in 2020. Uh, the, the double bonus making. Yep. Main event. Oh, yeah. This was something to behold. I'm gonna be honest, man, this was something crazy. How did it make you feel with your feelings on Khabib and Tony getting cheated out of the match? Uh, I mean, I'm kind of upset about it, uh, just because, you know, obviously that's a fight that I and a lot of other people uh, have always wanted for a really long time, and... It, 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 it's unfortunate. First and foremost, it's unfortunate that uh, the legendary fight we've been wanting for so long uh, has once again eluded us. Um, do I find it discouraging at all? Not necessarily. Because I'm one of those people that chooses to have a very positive uh, perspective, and I kind of just say to myself, oh, you know, everything's going to be fine. Um, you know, Tony Khabib will happen when it happens. Um, it, it, it's going to happen naturally. Uh, if it never happens at all, then truthfully, maybe it just wasn't meant to be. We don't know. But See, well, I was, my positive inkling on this situation is that I think we've been forcing it. Yeah. I think that we haven't let it happen naturally. And every single time that's it got canceled, other than unforeseen force, the unforeseen circumstances are, that were out of everybody's control, like the pandemic and other things, mm -hmm. was like we just did. It's just not ready. The the gods and the UFC gods in the sky just don't. They just, we're not we're not ready for it. Yeah. So they gave us they gave us a taste of a new guy that a lot of the, just the best Justin Gaethje has ever looked in a fight. All they just gave it to us instead, and I I think we should. I think we should just talk about how amazing that performance was. Yeah, man, that Justin Gaethje came to fucking destroy that night. That was, was, that was probably the best it, Gaethje's ever looked at his, in his entire career and probably the most important fight of his career. I, the, the coaching from the corner, whenever he was getting too happy with himself, Yeah. And he was just like, what happened last time? He goes, I got stopped twice. Yeah. And he goes, you're right. Yeah. So, good right. damage. Take some power off your shots. And I was just like, that's a coach. Yeah, I mean, that was a It's funny to me because you can hear exactly what they're saying now. And I, I like it for the audio quality. Yes. The no audience. So that we know literally everything as much as we can of what's going on. With yeah, it feels like song. whenever they mic up players in, like, football. Yeah. Or the NFL, like whenever you get to hear what the huddles were like. Yeah, I mean it. It was a, it was amazing because it was like at the end of the second round, his coach had uh, Justin Gaethje's coach. Um, I, I wanted to be able to pull up his name right here, um, Justin Gaethje's coach. But I mean, at the end of the second round, uh, he expertly uh, coached Gaethje and said, "Hey, man, you know, you're swinging. You're, you're trying to hit a home run too much. Uh, you know, you uh, you're trying to swing for the fences. You're gonna wear yourself out." It's uh, Trevor Whitman. Trevor Whitman is his coach's name. Um, I don't know if it was the head coach uh, that told him this. I assume it was. 
Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, he uh, he told Justin Gaethje, "Hey, take take a little bit of heat off the punches. You know, you're missing a lot. Uh, if you take the heat off, you're gonna have sniper shots for hands. You know, you're you're basically gonna be able to have a lot more precision. And then as soon as the third round opens up, man, I tell you, you know, it just it showed." It showed so quickly that how uh, Justin Gaethje was able to make that quick adjustment in between rounds like that and then just unload on uh, <clears throat> Tony Ferguson for the next two rounds uh, up to the point where, like you had just mentioned, uh, Justin Gaethje was all getting a little cock hit cocky, you know? Uh, yeah. Obviously very full of himself, very excited, you know? Obviously he, he knows how close he was to, uh, to winning at the end of the fourth. And going into the fifth, you know, his coach, like you just said, said, uh, you know, you've been in this position before. You know, don't get too happy. You know, don't get too cocky or else you are you might get put down again. <laughs> and so, you know, Justin Gaethje, you know, again, makes that quick adjustment. Doesn't let the excitement get too, uh, you know, get, get him too big of a head. And then he uh, went out and he dominated and he finished in the fifth. You know, he really put it all out there. Now, I'm not saying throwing the sand isn't a powerful mechanism that any martial artist should take into effect, but do you think that throwing the sand helped uh, Tony Ferguson in the fight? Are you talking about his uh, BJJ move? No, no, no. In the fight, in, during the fight, there's uh, Eddie Bravo or one of his corner people, Tony Ferguson, called out, throw the sand. And then he picked, he pretended like he picked up a handful of sand off the mat and threw it at Justin Gaethje. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, uh, honestly, like, like, I don't know. How do you think that affected the fight? I don't know. It affected the fight probably about as much as those punches to the leg. You know, that Tony Ferguson was constantly well, throwing out. Um, yeah, but it's the work, um, what's his name? The guy who got Showtime kicked. Uh, Hembrough. Henderson. Er, Vincent Henderson, you're right. My bad. Yeah, yeah. Not Hembrough. Vincent Henderson. Sorry. He uh, implemented that technique very well with uh, Nate Diaz in their championship fight. And it's shown to work before, but it, it just didn't work this time. You know, it kind of seemed like to me that it was just Tony Ferguson doing it just to be doing something, you know, the entire time. Because he was always doing something, you know. He was a very yeah. productive fighter. He, he attacked the leg uh, very, in various different ways, but it didn't seem to affect Justin Gaethje as much as Justin Gaethje kicked affect Tony Ferguson. Right. You know, it, it's really telling. You, know, you look at Justin Gaethje, man, and, he, and, and there's no better example than in a fight like this. He's going up against one of the most fearsome lightweights in the division. And Justin Gaethje is like two Tony Ferguson's. I mean, he is so stocky and so stacked uh, for, a di for a division like this. I mean, he just looks so bulky. You know, he has the same body type as Nurmagomedov in that sense, that they're just both so physically strong. And you can really just see it in the way he was just pounding Tony Ferguson, you know? I mean, Joe Rogan I mean, said it. every takedown in sense as well. Yeah, I mean, he, he was just beautiful out there. And Joe Rogan said it best when he said, uh, you know, Tony Ferguson looks like Tony Ferguson's opponents. Yeah, I, that is the one thing I was not expecting, is Justin Gaethje to have his fingers more damaged than his face. Yeah, I mean, it was it was really... Yeah, it was. It, I'm not saying that it wasn't a competitive fight, but there was. A, I, I feel like it was a very competitive fight till about round three. Yeah, because then, then it became one sided. Then, then it was very obvious at that point, because by that point, Tony Ferguson was already getting really badly cut up. Uh, his face was starting to swell, and, and he was just getting, every time he got hit with overhand, he just it sounded like it cracked him. Yeah, and it was amazing because it, it was really amazing. You know, you, I've never seen Tony Ferguson in, in a position in a fight where he, when he gets hit, he stops. You know? Yeah. Like he every just other time he rolled out of the way, or he did some crazy leg walk, or he's done something to be evasive. Yeah. But he. Like he had to take a few steps back that time. Yeah, and, and and you know, look if you guys are looking for an example of that, look no further than the finish to this fight, where Justin Gaethje uh, 
smashes Tony Early, Ferguson's yeah, face, look. and then Tony Ferguson just backs up like two steps, shakes his head, and then like stumbles into the cage. Only for Tony or Justin Gaethje, I'm sorry, to hit him like one or two more times before uh, Irv Dean just calls it off. You know, like I mean, it was just he really just could not defend himself anymore. And I mean, great stoppage, you know, in my opinion. He was just getting thrashed. Yeah, I mean that was fifth round. The man was just it's, not fighting. He wasn't firing back with really anything. It was time. It's got you. It's crazy. Because we've never seen Tony Ferguson get that hurt in a fight, but it also showed how well Tony Ferguson, Tony Ferguson can still do while getting really hurt. Yeah. Like, it shows just how tough he is, how much he can actually go through. And we've seen him get hurt, but we've never seen him, like, get this messed up in the course of a five-round fight. Right. Can I ask you something? What's that? I said, let me ask you something. I'm going to... What's that? Do you, do you, what do you think about, so Tony Ferguson's bit, the defense for losing, um, as I'm sure you've heard by now, was that he had trained for a really long time to fight Habib, and that he was, you know, in championship mode to fight Habib, not come out and fight a striker like Gaethje. Uh, so do you think that, you know, if you follow that line of reasoning, would you say that that is uh, a big contributing factor to why it is that uh, Ferguson uh, came up short? My take on this is if he was training to wrestle, even if it was defensive wrestling, right. why didn't he implement any of it other than the few takedown attempts after he had already been hurt? Because we know that just that Tony Ferguson can control one of those rolling leg locks that he does, and we know he does takedowns, but he didn't use any of them until later in the fight after he had already been locked as like a as like a plan B. Right. So if he had been training so hard for wrestling and other stuff, why would you use some of the stuff that you had been training, even if it was against another opponent? You could still use similar game plans. Like then you just switch to an all striking one, so. It's possible, but I just feel like you've been training for, you've been in the sport for over 10 years at this point, and just a change of opponent shouldn't be the downfall. Right, and also keep in mind, um, you know, he had, it wasn't, it was, it, you, it, relatively speaking, compared to when he was scheduled to fight Habib, he was scheduled to fight Justin on short notice, but, um, I don't, I, you know, I think it's one of those weird things, man. It, it, it's like, do, if you, I would say it was more of in training for stunt ball versus the style difference. Yes. Like being tired from the constant, like, over longer camp than he should have had. Like, I think that would be more of a contributing factor than the style difference of training for. Well, I mean, it's 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 also. Like, we've seen we've seen that Tony's a great striker, so it's not like he forgot. Well, yeah, that's true too. But it's also one of those things where you ask yourself, if he had spent the same amount of time he had spent, you know, training, however it is he was trying to train against. Um, Habib, as he did against Justin, and he had his camp oriented around how he would fight someone like Justin Gaethje, then do you think that that would, how do you think the fight would have uh, played out then, you know? That's kind of like, I guess that's kind of like the main, you know, takeaway, whether or not you agree with Tony Ferguson and his viewpoint on that, it's just more kind of like, I, take a step back and I, ask yourself, how would that, uh, how would that have worked out? I think... It would have played out similarly, but I think he would have hurt Justin more. But I still think the same thing would have happened because I think Justin is just so much, like, his punches just do so much more damage. Yes. And he was able to evade every elbow. He's like, <laughs> that's yeah. something that doesn't happen. I definitely want to say that. Thank you for so much for reminding me when you said elbow. Dude, like, the only thing that I noticed, really, because Tony Ferguson was on fire, but the one thing I noticed was that he was not throwing enough of those short elbows on the inside 
uh, when you step in uh, towards your opponent. You know, when you both kind of step in toward each other to have that quickest exchange, usually your opponent's coming in with hooks or uppercuts or something like that. And sometimes you'll, you'll catch Tony Ferguson in a fight, and he'll literally just step right in towards you and just hold a, a stiff elbow. You know, it's not like he's even really winding up the elbow. He just kind of walks into you with an elbow, and it just kind of like stops your momentum. You know, and I kind of thought to myself, if he had thrown a lot more of those elbows early on, and a lot of those close exchanges him and Gaethje had, it might have had a, a, a bit of a significant uh, effect on Gaethje. You know, I'm not saying it would have completely turned the tide of battle, uh, but it might have been well, an elbow fitting. Yeah, but because I mean, like, he called in the earlier fight uh, with Stephen Thompson, uh, not Stephen Thompson, Lillahees and Jeremy Stevens. That one elbow can change the entire fight. Oh yeah, oh yeah, totally, one hundred percent. And uh, but we—it's almost like also talking about that. It's not like it's almost like we forget that Justin almost got stopped at the end of the second round. That's true too. You know, Tony Ferguson landed a really heavy uppercut. I thought that Tony was going to take it, and then in the, that third round where Justin started talking is when he did start to slow down and not throw as many uh, solid punches to Justin's way. Exactly. I, I mean, you know, you're right, Justin. I mean, yeah, and I think that's why at the end of the second, uh, Justin's coach came up to him and said, "You're leaving yourself open too much. You know, you're swinging too wide." Um, you need that precision, you know, you need to get a handle on that. And I think that that uppercut was not necessarily um, the root of that problem I just mentioned. Um, but I think that at some point, you know, Justin kind of opened himself up in that in, in, uh, engage and uh, was throwing a lot of wide punches. You know, really trying to put the finish on right then and there. And, you know, Tony Ferguson was just able to slip in that really solid uppercut and put him down at the end of the second. And Justin's coach said, hey, man, we got to fucking stop that. So it's so it's it's really, it really kind of all comes, comes back around because it was like once that adjustment was made, you didn't see any more big uppercuts come from Tony Ferguson. You saw good strikes. You saw some really good strikes come out of him. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Tony Ferguson just couldn't keep up with the the power, strength, the pacing that Justin Gaethje was putting out. I mean, it was it was really intense and it was really crazy. It was just it's one of those fights that I was standing up because I was so stressed out and didn't know what was going to happen. It was just so great. Yeah, it was really. Loved good. every moment of it. I was standing up like pacing in between rounds, laughing at what the coaches were saying. Yeah. <laughs> Oh God, yeah, and, and I mean to have this be the the card that brings it all back, man. It was just worth it. So worth it. So and no more trip to see. Yep. Yeah. Moving on to the co-main event, we had Henry Cejudo versus the returning Dominic Cruz. With Henry Cejudo, the Triple C once again walking away with his championship belt, having successfully defended his bantamweight strap against the former greatest bantamweight of all time. Henry Cejudo now kind of by default walks away with said title. And, uh, you know, that's uh, kind of well worth it. You know, Henry Cejudo um, did his thing. That's all I can really say, you know. You can you can knock the guy however you want. You know, he even said it himself. You know, I'm, I'm the king of cringe, but you guys don't have to listen to my annoying ass anymore, so. It's just... I, I think it's better that he went up on top of the mountain. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, you really can't get much higher than that in terms of an echelon of eliteness. Because, I mean, Henry Sudo is just at the top. Yeah, I mean, you just, whew. Talk about people that, first of all, he's, you know, he's, he's out here saving the flyweight division. He defeats the likes of Demetrius Johnson and becomes arguably one of the greatest flyweights of all time. And then he comes out here, uh, and then he's beating the shit out of the likes of uh, TJ Dillashaw, Marlon Moraes, Dominic Cruz, you know, some, some really big names. 
it's it's just interesting, man. I mean, T.J. Dillashaw, obviously, during his time, I mean, he was even on steroids, man. It's who will still beat the shit out of him in round one. You know, Marlon Moraes, very competitive fighter, really great fighter. And then you've got uh, Dominic Cruz, and, you know, when I say that name, you know, need I say more? How do you feel about the stoppage? Um... I think that from if I if I were in the referee's position, I would probably have done the same thing, just because when he went over to pick Dominic Cruz back up, uh, Dominic Cruz was on the ground, but then he started to stand up. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of agree with the stoppage. Uh, I guess is a short answer there. I wasn't upset about it. Yeah. I feel like it could have gone on for a second or two more, but I probably would have stopped at the same time. Yeah. And like, I agree with you as well. I mean, it, it's, it's like, okay, obviously, when it happened, I'm just like, no! You know, because I'm like, Dominic Cruz was obviously trying to stand back up, but and even, you know, some of the commentators thought the same thing, but, you know, Daniel Cormier was just like, dude, just watch the replay real quick. And, you know, you watch the replay, and... There's just he like just hit, hit so many times. Yeah, there's like eight or ten unanswered shots leading up to the stoppage. I believe it was eleven. Yeah, so eleven unanswered shots leading up to that stoppage, and so it's like, how can you, how can you argue with that stoppage? You know, how can you argue with that? You know, obviously, and, and, and it's like beforehand, it was pretty obvious who was winning the fight anyway. That's not to say that Dominic Cruz didn't come out and, try, and and do his best, but if if you were to ask me who from the get go was winning that fight, it was Henry Cejudo the whole way. Yeah, and then after a crazy headbutt. Yes, this crazy headbutt that just split open then, the skulls. And then he just went out there and kneed him in the face. Yeah, fucked him up. It was crazy. I was very every single fight. I feel like I didn't. There's I feel like every single fight was just great, and I enjoyed every single one of them. Every single time, like, I would look away, I would hear, like, a reaction or something, and I would look <laughs> back and then be like, holy crap! Yeah. I mean, you know what was really uh, crazy is that uh, for Dominic Cruz, one of the biggest things, characteristics, I should say, that really defines him as a fighter is his uh, notorious footwork. Uh, his very unique uh, style of bouncing around the cage. Um, and he really shut it down. And yeah, Cejudo really su shut that down. It was like, you know, if, if you guys haven't seen uh, Dominic Cruz's uh, unique footwork, I, I definitely recommend checking that out because it is, it is, it is something to behold. Um, it's very, very interesting. And it, it's definitely worked in, for him for a really long time. But you got people like, you know, Cody Garbrandt who really picked that shit apart. And then you've got uh, Cejudo here who, even though he was like a head taller than Dominic Cruz, really proved to be the stronger fighter. And every time Dominic Cruz would, say, bounce from one area to the next, Cejudo already had that leg kick wound up and just fired a fucking cannon into Dominic Cruz's legs as he was uh, stepping down uh, from his jump or as he was mid-jump, you know, I, I'm pretty sure there's at least one point where uh, Suhudo kicked the legs out from underneath him, but I mean, I mean, you just see it, you know, all that power in such a tiny frame, and then just breaking apart and just deconstructing this legendary footwork that is infamous, everybody talks about it, but it's like crazy because here comes Henry Suhudo, who, granted, doesn't have like too many he's got wild victories over some wild people but they're more in like recent year stuff you know like he's he's had four really great fights to his name and those are his championship bouts and he's beaten a lot of other people really high level fighters and stuff too but I mean like those fights that define his career Dominic Cruz has maybe twice that you know and so really Go ahead, go ahead. It's going to the test of time, is all I wanted to say. Yeah, and... It's to be well, I mean... You know, it was just it was just interesting. It, it was really amazing because you don't often get to see fighters... Uh, you don't often get to see the greatest of all time versus the greatest of all time to find out who really is the greatest of all time. 
Now, if there is one thing I do want to ask you, it is kind of this thing that I'm sure is on a lot of different people's minds, and I'm, I'm positive was thrown around after the fight had happened by the commentating team, but do you think that Dominic Cruz's time away from the octagon any at all affected his um, his fight uh, last Saturday? Um, I don't. He's one of the biggest propagators that ring rust doesn't exist. So I believe him to a certain extent. I'm sure it had a, so, there's so many elements to it, but I think he looked really good. Yes. In every aspect of what he had tried to attempt to do and what he did land, yeah. I think that potentially just really shut down his style. Yeah. And he had to refer more to simple, uh, basic fighting stuff, but those were also landing, so it's hard to say that he, it could have affected him because I think to compare it to how well Fazuda was, uh, completely like destroying his style, but at the same time, Dominic was landing and he was making it competitive. Exactly. He was uh, obviously at some po- up to one, some point he was still in the fight, you know. So it's it, he was doing his legendary footwork very well. Yeah. But every time he moved one way or the other, he got like it. Yeah, and that's why I think that um, what you what you just said about Dominic Cruz being the poster child for you know, ring rust not being real is the fact that Dominic Cruz was out for a total not consecutively, but a total of like five years of layoff time. Uh just because of uh, injury. Every time. Yeah. And you know, even with major injuries that required, you know, massive surgeries, you know, it didn't stop him from uh, you know, coming back and destroying, and having had four years off with no injury and the same amount of time to train, I don't, you know, I don't really know. I don't really know. It's it's kind of one of those things where it's like Dominic Cruz really came out and he did his thing. You know, you can't ever you can't look at what Dominic Cruz did that night and say, you know, he didn't do enough. You know. Uh, Sahil so just came out the bigger man there, so that was great. That was that was a good, good fight, good co-main, and very very happy with the results overall. <clears throat> so, so you think uh, you think uh, Francis Ngannou still has Rosen Strikes like solo in his hand? He probably does. Uh, he probably just absorbs it into his hand and kind of just like is now a part of the black hole that is in Ganu's eyes and soul. Uh, I think that was the most like anime boss fight thing I've ever seen in the UFC. Because <laughs> they both just swap, like two guys that can knock you out with, the, with the, the, the wind off their punches just swinging and missing yeah. and then the third person to connect got him. Oof, that's like that literally, that literally is like a scene from a, a Japanese story or something. Exactly. Like it could have been in Return of the Dragon, which is both just two ginormous yes. behemoths with power and might and extraordinary punching everything and then the first one to connect and they went to sleep. Yeah. And like I, to this day I still watch the uh, the slow mo replay of that shit because that is like it's beautiful because it's like Rosenstrike successfully dodges like three punches but then it's like he comes up from having dodged the third one and and resets his frame and his head and it just clock you know just and Ghani's left hook just lands flush and then Rosenstrike is out immediately you know and then Ghani tried to land like strikes after that but he missed a couple and landed like one like head on but it was like he didn't even you know none of that after stuff mattered it, it, it was like he landed that one punch and it was just it it was just over uh so I have uh, I've added it to my list of the three most brutal knockouts ever yeah which is Ben Askren versus Rory Mazdal and Kevin Lee versus Kevin Gillespie or Gregor Gillespie and now this Rosen you know, Rosen Strike versus Francis Ngannou is just the three most brutal knockouts. Yeah, I mean this was legit. Of the past, the past two years. Yeah, Ngannou man, he really just 
terrified, you know, everybody last night, or not last night, Saturday. He really, you know, he came out, he banged, and it was so interesting because when it started, it did, it started, it did not start the way I thought it was going to start. Obviously, the knockout happened, and I expected a knockout to happen. It doesn't matter how fast it happened, 20 seconds be damned. But it was interesting because Rosenstroke came out, and it was almost like he wasn't even trying to fight uh, the way you would expect him to usually fight. Uh, he came out, uh, all, you know, throwing some uh, two leg kicks. He threw like two leg kicks, and he had his hands held up high. And it was almost like he was trying to, you know, have like some kind of Muay Thai bout or a kickboxing, you know, style going into the fight. Uh, it was very, very interesting. And it was like as soon as those leg kicks came out, and Ganu kind of had this look on his face. I'm not obviously not putting any words in anybody's mouth here, but I'm just that's what it looked like to me sitting there that he was just kind of like what is this guy doing you know and so he just rushes forward and turns the guy's lights out and you and I were talking about this when it happened uh, that Ngannou went and he did it and he was not scared to do it he was not hesitant to do it because he knows how strong he is he knows how powerful he is and he knows the kind of uh, damage he can output and he did it. And and that's why guys like him, Ngannou uniquely and specifically, can rush forward on another heavyweight. Something that you typically don't ever want to do. You know, heavyweights do not typically like to just rush into each other because that usually means someone's getting knocked out. But the difference with Ngannou and everybody else, Rosenstrike now included, is that he is confident enough in his power and his ability that he will rush into battle like that willingly with no fear on his face knowing that if he hits you yes knowing that if he hits you you are going to be knocked out there's just no avoiding it now yeah so now it's just a matter of whenever Whenever. I think the thing here that really separates Ngannou from the rest is, one, he has, so pretty much every heavyweight has knockout power. Yes, of course. It's in his, his, his is on another level already. Of course. Then, he is like one of the only heavyweights that throws like six punch combinations. Yes. Which is crazy, because when you're that big and you have to be fast to throw combinations, he can do both and still knock you out with, like, every punch if he wanted it perfectly. Exactly. I think that's really what separates him from the rest of everybody. Yeah, it's like he is on a completely superhuman, different level of strength compared to all these other big athletes out here. Even someone like... Uh, you know, obviously proven before, but even someone like Stipe, and even Rosenstrike, you know, I mean, and, and it's one of those things where I don't want people to count out Rosenstrike, if he got, even if he got knocked out that fast, if that had been anybody, if that were literally any other heavyweight on the planet, that pro that punch probably would have fucking knocked their lights out. The thing here is that Rosenstrike came in, and I still believe was a very legitimate threat. Because we had seen Rosenstrike's power and we had seen his capability. And, you know, we had seen that he had that same kind of winning attitude drive that drives most uh, heavyweight fighters to have just that little bit amount left in the gas tank when it really counts. And so it was one of those things where at any point, Rosenstrike would have been as just as vicious and as competitive a challenge for Ngannou as Ngannou was for Rosenstrike. Can I get a hear here? Here, here. The difference is experience. That is also true. And, you know, and Ganu's fought in championships before. You know, he's he's fought arguably the greatest heavyweight fighter right now in Stipe Miocic. So, and, you know, that kind of ties back to something we had uh, discussed in a previous uh, episode. Um, we had talked about these two and we had talked about what they were capable of it it, it was oh my gosh 
you know, we had talked about how it was going to be a test for Rosenstrike. If Rosenstrike wins this, it proves that he's part of a, a, a high-level caliber of fighters. And then if Francis Ngannou uh, wins this, then it just means that, you know, he's still on top. He still deserves the highest ranking he's, he can be afforded at this point. And he's probably one of the best, he's probably mm, the second or third best heavyweight, depending on who you talk to right now. So it just kind of, and, and, and also, I don't want people to think that because Rosenstrike technically failed his test, does not mean that that makes him a shitty heavyweight. That just means that he's not ready to fight people that are that are even close to the same level as someone like Francis Ngannou. And Francis Ngannou has set the bar very, very high, so that's already a tall order. So, choose to he wasn't ready. Exactly. He was not ready. And I, and I think that's... And I don't understand why. And I think that's why it confuses me. The kind of stance he came out with. And the kind of, the kind of style he was warming up to. Um, because it's like, bro, you're fighting Francis Ngannou. Who do you, what do you think is going to happen here? Well, he had a kickboxing style. Yeah. That's where his, uh, his original discipline comes from. But I think... I think he was also confused about Francis because I think he thought that Francis was going to rush forward earlier. Maybe, maybe. But uh, it's po- anything's possible. It, it, yeah. There was a, he, he had no idea that he was about to get his life knocked out, right. for sure. Right, I mean, obviously. Only when you enter a cage, you know that he's going to try to hurt you, but I don't think he knew that was going to be the immediate first... This, this first exchange was going to leave him out. Yeah, I mean... There's no, there's no telling, but it's also, um, it's just, it's just really overall, it, it was just a really good performance on Ngannou's part, you know. Here's my question for you. What's that? What do we do with Francis after this? Since the Derek Lewis, uh, not Derek Lewis, D D and D Bay fights having problems. Oh man, that is a good question. My man, let me just grab something here, and then I should be able to let you know. Okay, so let me see here. So, frick, that is such a good question, dude. Because Steve Bailey still cannot uh, do what he's he can't do anything right now. It's unfortunate, but he's kind of held up. And Daniel Cormier doesn't want to fight anybody until Stipe. He wants Stipe to be his retirement fight. And it kind of sucks because my first instinct says, Oh, dude, let's give him uh, Stipe, you know? Or not Stipe, give him DC. Let's do DC. But then, no, can't happen. (laughs) You're going to send DC to the grave for his retirement fight? Yeah, like, I mean... I mean, it's just like, because I mean, like, who else? He's so scared. Uh, it's, it's one of these things, because we ask ourselves, the top, let's say, let's say top ten. Let's go over the, I'll, I'll start at the beginning, work my way down, and then I'll tell you why half the fights don't work. Okay? So, boom. Championship bout with Stipe. Already fought. Already lost. UFC company... Daniel Cormier and possibly even Stipe are all hunkered down for uh, Daniel Cormier versus Stipe 3 fight. So that means that Stipe is tied up. Go to the number one contender. Oh, oh shit. Daniel Cormier is a number one contender. And we already just said his thing. So can't do that. That's fucked. Number two contender. Francis Ngannou can't fight himself. So that's fucked. Three. Curtis Blades. Francis Ngannou beat the shit out of Curtis Blades. Junior Dos Santos. Have uh, Junior Dos Santos has already been fucked up. He just lost to Curtis Blades. Exactly. Uh, number five, Derek Lewis. The Derek, the, he lost to Derek Lewis, but the Derek Lewis fight sucked, so nobody probably even wants to see it anyway. Unless they all fucking train really hard, and they have a rematch, and then Dylan comes out and beats the shit out of Derek Lewis. Actually, do you know what's interesting about the Derek Lewis versus Francis Ngannou fight? What? Is DC beat Derek 
Lewis for the heavyweight title and Francis or Francis lost to Stipe for the heavyweight title. So if they both are former championship contenders for two different champions and they fought for an interim belt while this while we were waiting for DC versus Stipe, that might be interesting. Bro, why not? Throw I think that's the only way you can make a fight like that interesting is you if you if you put an interim championship on the on the line. I mean, we're already handing them out left and right. Just give us another one. Why not? You know why, though? Why? Because they want Daniel Cormier to be the person to fight him next. So if they give Ngannou a fucking uh, interim championship, then that means that Ngannou has to fight him next, and they don't want that. Well, how about we wait for DC versus Stipe, or DC versus Stipe, just wait for it. And then while we're waiting for we're waiting for Stipe to heal up, put an interim one out. I'm down. I'm totally down. So we might just we'll have two heavyweight championship matches, but they'll just be for a while from now. But there's other stuff we could do to make the next few contenders for heavyweight. But it's better than what's happening in the lightweight division. Oh God! Don't even get me started. Anyway. Where we can't even figure out where a number one contender is. Oh, I know. It's awful. Anyway. Number six. Hair. Rosenstrike. Done deal. I already fucked him up. Seven. Alexander Volkov. Uh, Derek Lewis already fucked him up. Al- and you can maybe spin it to where Alexander Volkov fight is, is, is cool. But I mean, like, it's not going to be cool. Nobody's going to want to watch it. I would watch it just because it's in Gunnu. But I mean, like, what stakes does it have? Alexander Volkov will get fucking destroyed. Number eight, Alistair Overeem. He already destroyed Alistair Overeem. Number nine, Walt Harris. Walt Harris is fighting Alistair Overeem. He's tainted. I'm just kidding. But he's fighting Alistair Overeem this Saturday. And so depending on where that fight comes, Walt Harris is probably not even going to be in the top ten anymore. If he loses, and if Overeem loses, then... You already proved my point from point eight. And number ten is Alexi Olenek, who, you know, give it to him. Give it to him. Fuck it. <laughs> Alexi Olenek's been on fire lately, so why not? He's been choking everybody out. He just cracked top he's ten this been, week. You can put the hands on Verdue. Exactly. He just dropped top ten this week. And he earned it with his past victory, man. And we'll get to we'll get to his Fabrizio Verdun fight, but he's been on fire lately. So, and, and here's the thing: I would say let Alexei Olenek fight um, either Alexander Volkov or whoever wins the Alistair Over and Walt Harris fight, and then after he wins that, give him Junior Dos Santos, and then if he does that, then you can put him in anywhere in the top five. And have him fight anybody. You can have him fight the champion. You can have him fight Ngani. You can have him fight Blades. I don't care. Because you know at what? that point, he's, he's no. playing the higher echelon. Hey, no. You know what? DC versus Olenek for his retirement fight. Hey, why not? Dreams can happen. Because, you know, DC might lose. Olenek might choke him out. It could be cool. Olenek could become the champion for the first time. It could be a crazy event. DC might knock him out. It's quite possible. He could, uh, he could go right on into the sunset. And it could be awesome. It would be so much better than all these fights. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. And with your last course, they're both a little bit older. They could definitely throw hands with each other and not worry about getting knocked out. It could be so competitive. Exactly. Exactly. But that's kind of just like... That's just kind of where it all sits with the Francis and Ghana right now, you guys. That's just... It's all kind of up in the air. He had a great fight. It's basically what it all boils down to. So, we can go. Moving on. We've got uh, Jeremy Stevens versus Calvin Cater. God dang it, Jeremy Stevens. Was it Jeremy Stevens? Jeremy Stevens came in overweight, didn't he? I don't know who you're talking about. Oh, fuck. Don't do this to me. Are you, are you saying it again? Uh, I'm talking about Jeremy Stevens, Lincoln. Who the fuck is that guy? <laughs> Jesus. Why would it never not be funny? <laughs> it, oh, that's so funny. Yeah, but I don't know. Some, I saw somebody hit the floor. I don't know who it was, though. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was a really, really... They were both staying in each other. He was he did come in overweight, but it did seem like they were about the same size when the fight happened. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was it was definitely crazy. It was definitely wild because I just I don't know. It just I don't understand. Okay, first of all, Jeremy Stevens missed weight by like five pounds. I just want people to know that. I'm not surprised more people didn't miss weight. And I think that's why I feel the need to even point that out about Jeremy Stevens. But yeah, yes, but I mean, just who the fuck is he? You know? Yeah, right. I mean, at this point, fuck. He's getting. He's getting. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he got. He was Calvin Gator, man. He, he came in there and he whooped some ass. What? Yeah. And, he, and I mean, he's, he's, here's the thing. He's, he's, he's an underrated fighter. He just lost to Tony Ferguson and a few other people, but he's really well. He's really well rounded most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was it was pretty. I mean, it was a pretty competitive fight for a minute there, and then Calvin Cater just kind of finished it all off. So he did great. You know, he did hit it awesome. I, I can't wait to see more from him in the uh, featherweight division. Because he had a wonderful elbows. Yeah, because now you know we can see him go up against uh, guys that are in the higher echelon. Like you know, I know he I know he just lost to Zabit, um, and so that kind of um, put him under the edge, but you know he he he's got some he's got some. I, I'd be very really interested to see him fight some guys like uh, Yeah Rodriguez uh, and maybe uh, Chan Song Chong Song Jun, Korean Zombie. That's, yeah, that's, <laughs> you don't know, I'm just saying. <laughs> I know it's like I've heard it I've heard it pronounced, and for some reason when I read it and I try to pronounce it, I bet if I say it like. Chong Song Dong, Chong Song Jong. I don't know. It's the Korean zombie, basically, for all you guys out there. That's what everybody calls him anyway. So, but I, I would enjoy that fight. Yeah, I mean, but I'm pretty sure that one's already taken with Brian Ortega because they've been they've been mouthing off to each other. That's fine. Honestly, I, I'd be more interested in the Yair Rodriguez fight. I mean, he could fight Frankie Edgar if you want, just like a good passing of the torch fight. Um, unless uh, I think Frankie. Frankie Edgar's handed out enough of those lately. Okay. But yeah, I think the Yale Rodriguez fight still stands as probably my, my, my favorite uh, feature fight for Calvin Cater because, I mean, the guy, uh, he, you know, he was really tearing it up out there uh, against a really, you know, tough opponent like Jeremy Stevens. You know, we, we, we might not want to, we might, you know, joke and laugh and stuff, but I mean, he, he, he legitimately is a very uh, competitive, uh, strong fighter. And But, uh, you know, Calvin Cater just came in and led SmackDown and, you know, showed him up. That's all I can really say about it, you know? Good stuff. Oh, yeah. So, moving on. Go, we got your boy, the opening of the main card, your man, the Prince of War, Greg. Holy! Yeah. No comment. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> well, so basically, if you guys, he looked he looked pretty good this fight. He looked pretty good. Bad. He definitely looked um, a lot more. He looked more well rounded. Yes, he looked he looked the most physically fit. I think I've seen him in the octagon, and he looked probably the sharpest. Probably some of those are refined, I should say. He's looked in the octagon, and and that says a lot, you know, for a guy that's only been professionally fighting for like two years. Um, but I would say my one critical thing for Greg Hardy, I said I wouldn't talk back about him anymore if he won. But my one critical thing is it's kind of easy to look good when the other guy doesn't throw a punch or a kick for two rounds. Uh, yes, and that is, I will also say, <laughs> I will agree with that. That is a, another thing that kind of throws into question the legitimacy of the win here is because of the fact that Jorgen De Castro, uh, the Mad Titan, who in my opinion was, you know, viciously dominating round one, uh, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> I mean, not dominantly, but he def the, the strikes he threw definitely hit harder, and um, Greg Hardy was going for more volume, but I forget, somewhere in round one, it might have been in round one, now that I think back on it, somewhere in, middle, in round one, and then maybe in round two, but then pretty much throughout the rest of the fight, 
Yogan De Castro was throwing some nasty leg kicks, and he he just grazed Greg Hardy. He, Jack, Greg Hardy went to check it, but then Yogan De Castro was so far away that he grazed the shoelace, basically, of his foot on the shin of Greg Hardy's leg, and effectively, like, broke his foot, you know, and basically made himself unable to even properly fight anymore. It was it was pretty it was pretty apparent, <laughs> I should say, that that's kind of what it what it boiled down to. He called somebody out at the end of the fight. Oh, yeah, I forget who, but I was actually going to say, uh, he said that he wanted to be on the Joe Rogan show, that's and I was actually was. interested in how that might go. Yeah, I think that's what I'm thinking of. I don't remember if he called somebody out, but he, he most likely definitely did. Um, he did the, the thing you just said. <laughs> he definitely said, I want to be on the Joe Rogan uh, experience. Uh, yes. So anyway, that that'd be cool. Um, so it, it, the the journey of Greg Hardy's MMA career is a strange, yet ever evolving one. So it's like it's like either he wins a fight by some kind of weird shit, or definitively, or there's always, it's like he either gets through completely unscathed. Or he goes through an experience where there's always like a, like a very suspicious eye thrown at him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's just strange. So anyway, we're gonna go ahead, get off of that, um, and go over these gosh diggity darn prelims, guy. How wonderful were these prelims? Weren't they as good as a normal card? Yes. I would definitely agree with that. You could take the prelims and the early prelims and kind of just merge them together. You'd have a really kick-ass main card for a fight night. And that is wonderful. The thing that closed out this prelim was probably probably my favorite slash most disappointing fight. That is. Probably didn't win. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. Here she has because California is off for fighting the losing streak. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. When you say it like that, it's just like, oh, my cowboy. No, cowboy. Hey, it's okay because there's no more guns in the valley. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good competitive fight. You can't be mad at the outcome. You just gotta be accepting of the journey. Dude, it literally felt like the end of Logan. <laughs> That's why I made that word for me. Bye, Shane. I feel like I'm gonna fucking bury Donald Cerrone and just put cowboy hat on the grave. <laughs> you put the seal open up like lines and pour it out. I mean, dude, I mean, like, here's the thing, dude. I, I, that fight was so competitive. And I think that genuinely, it, I mean, obviously it was a split decision. And it genuinely could have gone either way. And I will say this, I don't care what you say, that eye poke mattered. It, 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 mattered. it mattered so much. And, mo and, and it's not just because of the initial um, confusion. You know, immediately after it happened, when Donald was like, eh, you know, you know, like screaming, you could hear him screaming. And uh, the ref, who's usually a really good ref, just didn't see this one eye poke in this one fight. You know, just shit happens. And there were those immediate uh, blows that happened afterwards. You know, that's typical for usually any time a situation like that happens. You know, bad a bad call happens, the ref didn't see a call or something like that. And uh, something ends up happening, and, you know, the guy gets fucked up for a little bit because he doesn't defend himself right away. Uh, because he thinks the ref is going to uh, stop the fight, but the ref didn't stop it. What I'm specifically referencing are all the times after that in the third round where Donald Cerrone literally 
would get hit with something because he can't see out of his eye. You know? I'm talking head kicks. I'm talking hooks. I'm talking these crazy upper... I'm talking the kind of shit that normally, throughout the beginning of the fight, he was doing really well against. But because he's got literally one eye to work with, he's getting pieced up with all these moves and shit that, in my opinion, at the end of the day, put Anthony Pettis over the edge because of something illegal and because of a bad move. And... They laughed about it after. Do what? They laughed about it after. Yeah, they definitely laughed about it. I mean, it was really funny to me personally when Anthony Pettis was like, dude, there's no way. You know? And then Don yeah, was like, like watch that again. he was like, just watch. watch he goes, just watch. And then it happens and Anthony Pettis is just like, yo, man, special effects be crazy these days. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even know what they're doing over there in the booth, but that is some CG. You can totally... That is a Superman mustache, upper lip finger that just went to your eye. That is not real. He couldn't believe it. He just couldn't believe it. And the ref couldn't believe it either, because the ref is sitting there telling Donald, it's, it was a punch. It was a punch. Keep defending yourself. Bull fucking shit. It wasn't that with a full five, five finger fillet slapped right into his goddamn cornea. Do you want to hear something that you might not like? What? Maybe, I'm not saying he should, or that he has to, maybe Cowboy goes over to Bellator. Yo, <laughs> Don Sloan would slap ass in Bellator. That's what I'm saying. Imagine Cerrone, that red and white belt with the B on it, around his waist. Oh my god. Yo, he could be a champion! Oh my goodness. Or, even, he could go win a mill over at, uh, the uh, TSL. Yo, he, loves, he loves doing the, like, four fights within, like, a few months of each other, a few weeks of each other. That's what they do with the tournament, and then it's over. Yeah. You don't have to keep doing it for every year. You just win the mill. Go over to the championship branch, or go over to Bellator, or do whatever you want, dude. Keeps, keeps little danger more about motorcycle riding. Exactly. And, and, and chewing tobacco. The world is your oyster, man. Be the legend of Cowboy. Ugh. Wherever you may ride. Exactly. Go out. Be free. You know? Don't worry about these banditos. And you know what's crazy, dude? Is that we sit here... And people are going to be like, oh my god, Cowboy should retire, all of a sudden, the other. First of all, that's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. Whether or not he should retire, I think is more dependent on how old you are and how much damage you're really taking. And not necessarily... I mean, obviously, if you're on a seven-fight losing streak, you're on... In, in, I mean, if he loses his next fight, you might open my eyes a little bit to a retirement fight. But... Like, I want him to retire. I just don't think that he is at the same level as everybody at the top of the heap anymore. I definitely think that as the years go by more and more, it, whether I don't think it has anything to do with his own personal age. I just think it has to do with the fact that during Durant, Donald Cerrone's like prime, like his prime prime, um, he had uh, he was part of a wave of fighters, and I feel like we talk about this at least every other podcast that there's a a wave of fighters uh, in terms of like evolution like how mixed martial arts has evolved and Donald Cerrone was part of this group of this really this generation of fighters that fought a certain way uh, that are a certain way and then fast forward and you know then you've got Donald Cerrone going up against a lot of guys nowadays and he's just not really able to keep up. He's not really able to do what he needs to do. And and, and truthfully, if, we, if, we're, if we're honest with ourselves here, um, Donald Cerrone has been on losing streaks before. Donald Cerrone has typically been on... Um, you know, he's had some crazy win streaks, and he has had some significant losses uh, throughout his uh, career. Um, you know, obviously losing every championship fight he's ever had is pretty is pretty significant. But in between, in the year two thousand seventeen, 
pretty much the entire year of 2017, he was on a three-fight losing streak. And then he followed that up with a win, followed up with a loss, went on a winning three-fight winning streak, and now currently he is on his longest losing winning losing longest losing streak he's ever been on, and that's significant. But there is evidence that we can take from the past and say to ourselves, well, maybe if he gets one more fight, maybe he'll win. The problem here that I want to coagulate on is that the fights that uh, Donald Cerrone loses are fights against like really elite guys I'm talking like elite guys and the people he wins against at least the people he's been winning against um, in the past year or so in the past two years I should say um you know, they were kind of middle tier guys. And Donald Cerrone is a top ten guy. I feel like Donald Cerrone will always be a top ten guy. But he fights some of these middle tier guys, he wins, and then every time he has that chance to step up to that higher echelon of power and success, he stumbles. And so the real question here that I guess this whole rambling spiel I'm going on is going to be wrapped up to is will Donald Cerrone reach that point in his career where he can keep up with these really elite guys because I mean he's beaten Matt Brown he's beaten Benson Henderson he's beaten Ally Quinta he's beaten guys that at some point in their careers were really really elite guys you know Edson Barboza Eddie Alvarez. He's beaten some legit uh, opponents in his, in, his, in his time and in his day. But the question is, can he do it now when he really needs it? Or is he always going to be that guy that the crowd loves and can put on a decent show but can only beat um, middle tier guys the kind of guys that would never even amount to uh, a top 10 position or uh, a championship anyway like Alexander Hernandez you don't know that he's still young or Mike Perry if you, if you want a better example yeah but I feel like Mike Perry is like at the same level as Cerrone where he loses and wins but he also has amazing balls. Yeah, but Mike Perry, yeah, comparatively speaking, is like further down the drain. You're probably right, but then I'll have to Not shitting on, not 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 on Mike Perry. You're not trying to single Mike yeah, Perry no, out. No, I got that. I'm but just saying beat, that Donald Cerrone is. He beats good guys. He, yeah, I'm saying he's beaten good guys, but I mean, the last really talented guy he beat was Ally Quinta. And, and that was a great fight but that was also Ally Quinta during a time that's when Ally Quinta yeah, was also out the door that's why I think you should go over to Bellator because I don't like I don't think you should retire because when yeah. guys retire is when they don't want to do it anymore and Cowboy loves this see MMA fighters are like caged animals but the difference here is that like they like being inside the cage and the typical saying with animals is when an animal truly dies it's when they're in a cage and it's when their soul dies and for MMA fighters when they get out of the cage that's when they really die that's when they lose you know the thing that made them that's when their soul dies and that's why so many MMA fighters that retire have to tie themselves as close to the sport as possible because it's, it's who they are. It's all they know. And so that's why I also don't want to see Donald Cerrone just up and leave. You know, Bellator was made for guys like him. That's, that's where people like Chel Sonnen and, and Vanderlei Silva went off to go, you know, com compete in their golden girl years. You know what I'm saying? Like... Rampage Jackson. Exactly. Uh, Fedor, all these guys. 
It's where they go. Because, cause, cause, you know, they, they want to keep fighting. They're fighters. So why not go up against... Why not have these big money fights? You make a fuck ton of money. And then fight other people that are famous, like you. Go over there and... Fight with Greg David Musasi or something like that, you know? Just something crazy. Just like on VT. Yes, exactly. It doesn't matter if you lose. You're still fighting. You're still making money. And if you're still putting on a show, God damn it, good on you. You just probably shouldn't be doing it... Um, In the competitive version of it. Exactly. Because I mean, there's no doubt that if he went over to Bellator, he'd, he'd slap some ass. I firmly believe that. I firmly believe it too. So I think I think that the UFC is overcrowded at the moment, and there's a lot of guys that aren't at that top tier level, and I think a lot of them could go over to other promotions and do better. Exactly. So I'm gonna get off the spiel of Donald Cerrone. I'm not gonna win it. Exactly. Moving on. Perfect. Let's do it. Alexi Olenek or Olenek. Um, you know, he... he, he I just took the beat down on the sun didn't he? He did the damn thing. He did the damn thing. I knew he was going to do the damn thing. You I've know? never seen him so hands like that. I didn't expect it. Honestly, I, I, I definitely expected the jiu-jitsu, the kaijutsu and stuff like that to come out a lot in this matchup. But, um... It was, it, it was really interesting because the way he was really throwing these combos and being super aggressive even early on at the beginning of the rounds I, everything going the whole 100, 100 miles here and uh, really fucked up Fabricio Verdun but what was really interesting for me was that every time it did go to the ground you saw like that sparkle of Fabricio's um, really good jiu-jitsu coming out uh, because it was like every time they, they, they tied up and they went down, Fabricio looked like the fight was turning in his favor, you know? And... Yeah, he got, he got a good Americano or a Kimura or some kind of arm trap that he got pretty deep, but Olenek was able to defend it to his best of his ability. Yeah. The one thing that I noticed especially was just how good a shape Olenek was in oh, compared yeah. to Verdun. Dude, I, I, I knew Verdun was going to lose just based on how he looked at the weigh-ins. And even starting the fight, dude, I said it, and I said it unabashedly, that guy looked like shit. He looked awful. It was terrible. I couldn't get over how bad he looked. And here's the thing. He has not looked like that before. But you know what else, you know, kind of uh, hints to why he looked like shit? Why? It's because he spent the last two years fucking detoxing his ass getting off these anabolic steroids, you know, spending two years suspended, getting fucking drained, you know, and because he's abused his body so much by this point, you know, pumping his fucking ass full of toxin, that he looks like fucking, he comes back and he looks like fucking shit. It looks like he didn't even fucking train for this, but the, but the, but the really shitty thing here is that I do think he trained for this, and he, he's just, he's just so fucked beyond belief that um, it ended up not mattering, you know? It ended up just showing how well and in shape Olenek is and just how awful and terrible Redoom is. And there. <laughs> it was really good. It was really good to play the fight. And uh, I, just, I like the That's all I got to say. Yeah. I mean, I'll say this. Final thoughts on that. It looked like if Olenek had actually tried to engage on the ground, Verdun probably had a chance of winning. Um, yeah, that was, the only, that was the only way I saw it going. I was just like, well, if he really gets with his mission here, he could pull it off, but I don't think he could make back of the points that he lost throughout the first two rounds. Exactly. He, he really would have had to have gone for that submission and gone for it hard to like make any kind of headway. But, yeah, so that was that. Moving on, there was... What about, the, what about the highway robbery of Michelle Waterson at this fight? Do you thought that was robbery? I thought it was highway robbery to the highest extent. Very interesting. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely say it was a very, very close fight. Obviously, one of the more competitive fights on the card, but... I don't know, dude. I, uh... 
let me just uh, let me just tell you the one important stat. Okay. So their strikes are pretty much even. Pretty right? much, yeah. And the one takedown that Carlos Esparza got came after ten or nine takedown defense successful takedown defenses. Oh yeah. And I feel like those nine successful takedown defenses count more than the one takedown. Yeah, when you say it like that, yeah. And every, and it's also the difference in the striking is that Carlos Barza landed at five or four more strikes, but every single one of Michelle Waters' the strikes were significant. Yes. So no. I just I just felt like Michelle Morrison definitely should have got a unanimous decision out of that, but uh, it was just my opinion. Now, here's what I will say. In... And, and this is in Michelle Watterson's uh, defense. So I'm, I'm with you so far. So if you look at... It's, it's very, very minute. And I think that's what this fight kind of comes down to are some of the minute details. Because on on Watterson's side, you've already pointed out, uh, she's def- she defended 9 of 10 takedowns. Now... The problem lies in. Let me just check real quick. Okay, so this this is this is going into her defense as well. The first takedown was in round one. That means that pretty much all the other takedowns throughout the fight, Michelle Watterson was able to overcome. Meaning that that one slip up in round one was not an indicator of what was to come. Meaning that she only got better over time. Now, also, in her defense, if you look at this, I know this is really, really scratching the surface and really trying to, you know, not the surface, but really digging the bottom of the barrel here. If you look at the consistency of their strikes, how many strikes did they land out of the total number of strikes that they threw? Uh, It's dead even for both. For Carla Esparza, out of the total strikes that she landed, versus how many she uh, threw, she landed 45% of her total strikes. Same goes for Michelle Watterson, 45%. You go to significant strikes. Of the 44 significant strikes that uh, Michelle Watterson threw, also side note pointing out what you had also said earlier again about how every strike that she threw was a significant strike, 45% of her total overall strikes she landed. But with Carla Esparza, in terms of her significant strikes, she only landed 44% of how many strikes she threw. So it's... it's That's a, what I'm saying! It's very, very minute. And it's one of those things where it kind of it kind of throws me off and it makes me think that whoever judged it looked at that one takedown as the thing that was supposed to to make the difference here and they also looked at the number of strikes that Carlos Barza had in comparison to Michelle Watterson not taking into account the fact that as the fight went on Michelle Watterson defended more takedowns and takedowns were put on her um, and, and that happens you know you adjust while you're in the fight so if you get taken down in the first round, you're automatically going to adjust to make sure it never happens again. And if you're a good fighter like Michelle Watterson, it didn't. And then if you look at the, the strikes, it doesn't matter if Carla Sparza went for volume and she scored a slightly higher amount of strikes. What matters is that of those strikes, Michelle Watterson landed every single one with enough with with power, you know, very significant strikes. But then with Carlos Sparta, she just happened to land one more significant strike. It doesn't matter that it was of a lower consistency compared to uh, Michelle Watterson. What matters is that overall she just got more of those points. Um, and, and that's just and that's just what it boils down to. I think here is points. And if we go round by round. Um, you'll kind of you'll kind of see what, what what I'm talking about here because in the first round it, it kind of uh, creates an even playing field with Carla Esparza you know she was she was down in terms of strikes 
Michelle Watterson was well over her in terms of strikes. And that's largely in part to the fucking uh, tree trunks that Michelle Watterson has attached to her body that she uses to walk around and kick the shit out of people. Um, but then Carlos Boza gets that one takedown, and boom, you know, you've got yourself an even matchup. Because they didn't really land that many strikes in the first place in round one. So it, so that ex, so that takedown kind of carried a lot more weight. And then once you go into round two, it's still a very close and still a very competitive fight. But Carlos Esparza comes out with higher, you know, more striking uh, total. Even though it's very, very minute lead, she still has that lead. And then going into uh, the third round, once again, a very, very small and a very, very, very um, tiny window, I guess, to reiterate, just how close the fight was, Carlos Esparza still led in those fights, in the in those strikes. So it it uh, it's silly. It's just silly, in my opinion. I agree. I agree. I mean, like it's one of those things, man. It's just it's just it's just genuinely one of those things where it was so even and it was so competitive. Um, if Michelle Watterson had pulled just you know one more thing out of her ass. You know, one crazy thing uh, that would have set her apart, um, she, she probably could have pulled out a victory, so. <clears throat> what a competitive fight between... <laughs> My window is the enemy of everything. What a competitive fight between uh, Vincente Luque and Nico Price, though. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah, man. That was a great fight. That's a good fight, you know. I mean, Vincente Luque is... Uh, it, was really it was a very necessary doctor stoppage. Yes. Yes, because Nico Price literally could not... See, that, that eye was fucked. That eye was just so fucked. That was probably the most fucked I'd see an eye this year. It's, yeah, and then did you see the Twitter post of the stitches afterwards? Oh, no, I haven't. It, no, just don't. No, I have to. Yeah, look at that, because it's like his normal orbital bone and everything, like it's all swollen, shut, and then there's the, the oh. 20 or so stitches on, up and up all the hand below his eye. Oh. oh my god. Isn't that terrible? Oh Now imagine god. if they just let it keep going. He straight up looks like Robert De Niro in the 1990s movie, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Yeah. Holy Now imagine fuck. if they let that go for like the, the another three minutes. Mm. How much more damage could happen? I probably would have had to start protesting MMA. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but fuck, dude. That would have been inhumane. It could have, like, it's probably going to uh, damage his career to some extent, just any injury usually does. Yeah, and but that's like, pretty serious if injury. If he kept going, he probably couldn't get he probably wouldn't be. He'd probably have like a Michael Bisping thing going. He he definitely would be. Oh my god, that's that's fucking sickening, dude. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw sick. it. Like, oh my god. Like uh, I got a notification about that, like while the main card was going on, and I just went, Whoa! Oh Jesus! I had a I had a King of the Hill moment. Yeah. Do it. Whoa. There you go. Yeah, it's just it's just crazy. Like, uh, I mean, like you said, that was a very uh, competitive fight. And I thought that was very uh, well. I thought Vincente Luque really put it on, and I think Nico Press really put it on. And really, it just kind of came down to uh, the uh, the doctor stoppage at the end there. But um, you know, and that that's another one of those uh, fights that could have ended in a, a split decision easily. Easily, 100%. Um, or maybe more of a unanimous decision, but it was that competitive, I'd probably put it uh, as a split decision, ultimately. Um, it, it, I, it, was, it was real good. I think that everybody made the right call and executed their, their game plans as properly as they could. Yeah, and, and, and while Vincente Luque was just very cool and concise the entire time, really taking his time, picking apart his opponent when he needed to, exchanging when he needed to, but not being too overzealous. Um, he did really, kind of the opposite. Yeah, with Nico Price, he just kind of, 
he was just wilding, man, and, and it was working to an extent. You know, he he would just wild out and catch uh, Luke and mess him up. You know, stumble him, wobble him. Uh, but Vincente Luque was tough enough to just hang in there, keep up with his consistency, not lose his composure, and he came out with a pretty impressive victory uh, on top of that. Uh, so, yeah, he did really great. Proud of, proud of that. Uh, before I move on, I just want to say Nico Price's shoulders kind of make him look like a Megatron. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Coelho de Mille. Yeah, that's a good one, too. I mean... Uh, the guy looks like he's trying to grow an extra pair of shoulders on top of his shoulders. Very interesting. Very, very anime. I love it. He looks like a character from Yu Yu Hakusho or something. <laughs> uh, sorry. Sorry for the demonstration. Anyway. Um, well, my uh, second favorite tough contestant, Bryce Mitchell, yes. throwing every twister and triangle choke you've oh, ever seen. Beautiful grappling match. Beautiful grappling match. I could, like, when people say that all grappling matches are boring, not everyone is boring. No. I mean, for that, was a, that was a masterful of just wrestling and jujitsu and judo. It was just wonderful. I mean, here's, here's, here's what I think makes the difference between a boring grappling match and a good re- or a grappling match. If the people it's that are different. grappling are good at grappling and have good cardio, the grappling is going to be amazing, and it's going to be phenomenal. If the grappling is going... If the two grapplers are bad, and their cardio is shit, and they're just flopping on each other and kind of just stalling and just kind of letting their weight sit on their opponent, that's going to be boring. You know? But when there is action, when there is pressure, when there are, when there are transitions, when there are submission attempts every five fucking seconds, that's going to be a kick-ass grappling match. And, and, it was, and it was more badass because it wasn't just the person who won, Bryce Mitchell, who pushed the action the entire time I mean he did you know, he kept the pressure on he maintained control pretty much the entire three round fight but Charles Rosa also came out and he didn't just lay there and let Bryce Mitchell you know sit on him the entire time he was constantly sprawling he's constantly rolling he's constantly moving and trying to get to some kind of position that's going to be able to uh, give him an advantage and most often that position was standing up he could not roll with that guy he could not roll with Mitchell at all and what's even funnier is that um, apparently before the fight uh, Charles Rosa was just shit talking Bryce Mitchell the entire time talking about how much of a better grappler Rosa was than, than he was and Bryce Mitchell took that pretty personally and so he said I'm going to prove who's the better grappler out here in the fight tonight and he did I mean he, he, he it looked like the other guy uh, was not a black belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu like I'm pretty sure he is he is. Yeah. I believe really, it, it made him look like that Bryce Mitchell was the black belt who was giving a lesson to a lesser belt. Yeah. I mean, it was very beautiful. And dude, not only, okay, not only did the man throw two twisters in there during the fight, he threw in like five arm triangles. And they were, a few of them looked like they were going to win it for him. Yes, especially very early on. Especially during the first arm triangle where you could because there's no audience so you can just hear everything and you can just hear Rosa just loudly gasping for air you know like he he, he's, he was going to go out any second you could tell and if it had not been for the bell uh, for like the first round I'm pretty sure or the second round um, Mitchell probably would have had that uh, first twister he had put on him Because I'm pretty sure uh, the first twister he pulled um, got called off because of the bell. It did. I remember he goes like, oh, no. Like, he, the second he got it, the bell went. And he was just like, I did all that. Yeah. But, I mean, hey. Finally, like, that but then he just continued to dominate. Yeah. And then some point in the third, I'm pretty sure he pulled off another twister, which was just 
blew, blew, blew my balls off, honestly. Like, it was just insane. Because it's like, there were only the two Based twisters. Based on the UFC a twister in UFC at all, but let alone two. Yeah, the same fight by the same fighter. So, it was very, very impressive. And really, uh, and, and obviously they ended with respect and stuff. And the funniest thing about the whole thing was that... Um, during the fight, especially during the third round, like you could just hear hear the guy, but the but uh, Charles Rosa was constantly talking to uh, Bryce Mitchell. Any chance he got, he was, yeah, he was like, "Let's stand up, you know, you know, prove your man and stuff. Let's stand up." He he was he was doing everything the entire fight physically to get up and get away from Bryce Mitchell, but. <laughs> he was so beaten and he was so lost by the time the third got around he, the only thing left in his arsenal was to just somehow try and negotiate with Bryce Mitchell <laughs> please let's just stand up I swear please you're the better craft let me throw hands exactly exactly and it was like it didn't matter even when they were stood up because every time Charles Rosa did manage to get back to his feet Bryce it didn't it didn't matter you know the striking was irrelevant because every time you know even if, even if a kick was thrown Bryce Mitchell was already ducking under it and getting a single leg or he was just blast double legging uh, Rosa back into the canvas so it was it was masterful. It was genuinely masterful, and, and I'm very, very impressed uh, by, by Bryce Mitchell. And before we move on to the very last uh, fight, closing out here, I just wanted to say that uh, Bryce Mitchell's uh, closing line uh, in his uh, post-fight interview was probably the funniest thing I had heard all night that night. Four. And it was, okay, so he's from Arkansas, so he's got this really thick southern accent. And the last thing he said was when Joe Rogan asked him something, you know, like, how does, how does it make you feel or, or whatever. And he went on this whole, like, feel. But the very last few things he said were, I, I, love, uh, I love my mama, I love God, I love Arkansas, and I love fighting. And I, said, and I was just like, hey, if, you, if you think that's funny, listen to his last uh, after interview. Because he did a whole rant about how uh, people were making fun of him because he's from Arkansas. And then he wins and he's like, and that was from Arkansas. Exactly. So it's that. It's great. It's, I just sit back and I was like, hey, man, you said it best. <laughs> It, his, his after interviews are almost as masterful as his jiu-jitsu. I mean, it was great. I, I loved it. And I, I don't think you could have done uh, better justice, you know, for your pride in your state, man. You know, you keep doing your thing. You're kicking ass, you know. Dude, I told you, he's one of my favorites. He's so talented and he's so, so funny. Yeah. So, last but not least, we're going to close out here with Smiling Sam Alvey and Ryan Superman Span. The reason I even wanted to really bring this up is not just because we already made it to the early prelims anyway. Usually I stop at the prelims, but there's only two fights in the early prelims, and the next event, UFC Fight Night, is doesn't have early prelims anyway, I don't think. So anyway. Um, and the other main reason is just because, out of respect for... Gotta represent my own state... Ryan Spann is from Tennessee as well. He's from Memphis, uh, even though that's you know all the way over in West Tennessee. It's still Tennessee, and I don't give a damn. Uh, he put on a pretty good performance uh, against uh, Sam Alvey. He almost choked him out in the first. I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, Sam's face turned completely purple, like beat purple. Um, and I thought that I thought was he cool. Was done. Yeah, I thought he was going to be done, uh, but you know he just kept smiling uh, and pushed through it. Um, Ryan Spann got some good takedowns, um, even though um, <clears throat> even though uh, Sam Alley had a good more amount of strikes, there was just there, you could definitely just tell that there was a lot more control and power behind uh, Ryan Spann. He was just he was just in control. 
pretty much the entire fight, you know? And and that was pretty cool to see. That was pretty cool because he would do something crazy. Like, I, I mean, there were just times where he was just dodging punches like he was in a movie, you know? Really expert-level dodging and, you know, ducking, weaving, bobbing. I mean, he was doing it all. He, he would even do a complete 360 spin around just to, just to avoid something. It was almost like, you know, he was out there dancing half the time. It, it was pretty impressive. Uh, I mean, Sam Alvey really did great, too. I mean, he, he busted chops, you know, it, it, it's not like he came in and got walked over, but there was always this little itch in the back of our minds that Ryan Spann was the one that was in control of the fight, you know? Yeah, for the most part. He didn't really get gassed out towards the end, and it was pretty competitive towards the beginning, and then there was a nice little stint at the end where they started swinging at each other, but all around it was a very... Very good fight with Ryan Spann, pretty much dominating most of it. Yeah, it was, it was, it was great. I liked it. It was fun. And that pretty much goes for the entire card, you know, from beginning to end, starting with Ryan Spann and ending with Tony and uh, Justin. It, it was just it was just an impre- incredible, exciting fight, you know? It, everything was just competitive. You could just feel the competitive nature coming out of pretty much everybody, you know, whether it be Dominic Cruz who's been sitting out for four years, or, um, you know, uh, fuck. Like the thing I just knocked me out rather than strike. Right, you know, it was just a good example. Like, it's just, you could just feel the competitive nature and the excitement just oozing off the fighters and the commentating team and everybody, and it just was so infectious, and it just it created this real good mood that just carried me throughout the entire night, and I just had fun, and I loved it, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the UFC is back, and I hope good things keep rolling, and I hope everybody is doing well, and I hope everybody's, you know, doing great, and I, I'm just, I just love it. I'm in such a positive, energetic mood when I talk about UFC 249, because it just embodies this good feeling, fuzzy warmness inside I get when I think about what it was like those near two months where we just we didn't have something like that you know and and I, know, I don't want to get like too sentimental but I, you know closing out here but part of me kind of feels like people have their own stuff all over the world you know you could have video games and movies you probably have your favorite TV shows or reality shows or whatever you know that you put a lot of investment into and, and you put a lot of care and, and you have a, a, a bit of you know passion about and then when you're just kind of deprived of it you have an investment exactly you, you get so deprived of it you know for damn near two months it's like you you miss it you know it doesn't matter how much of, of the memories you have it doesn't matter how many replays you have it's just you want the experience to keep going and you want it to keep growing and evolving and it, it just it, I'm glad to have that feeling back you know it, it's it, it's it's just nice it's just nice to not feel like something's missing it was nice to have something normal happen exactly and, and I think that's what we needed in this stressful time that we're all going through is something that at least semi resembles a normalcy so yeah. In closing words, I just wanted to say that Justin Gaethje is the king of violence in the lightweight division. Yep. And I called it. But, moving on. There you go. Hey, man. Hats off to you. Hats off to you and everybody who... Hats off to you and fingers up the butt to the Vegas odds people, so... <laughs> so that's going to be it for us. I hope that everybody involved is doing well, as long as as well as everybody who enjoyed watching. Oh yeah. So that's going to do it for us on this episode of Ninth Corner of the Octagon, uh, episode ten, I believe. Man, we have made it to the big one zero. By the way, let's celebrate oh, that. Oh my goodness, it's a regular thing now. Yeah. Yeah, this is probably the longest running series we've ever had. And we're doing great, bud. Yep, so that's going to be it. We hope, wish you guys a good night and a good farewell. And remember, um, koozie coasters can't kiss your mama's cunt, so love you. <laughs>